Let's pray. God, we are here to open your word once again, to look into that scroll, the one you revealed about those things which must soon take place. What reveals your son coming from heaven to the earth to reign and to rule, to reward those who have longed for his appearing. God, we pray that we would be those eagerly anticipating your vindication, your manifest glory that day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you indeed are Lord. Oh God, we pray this morning as we open your word that you would work in hearts, that not one of us would leave this room unchanged, but with all eyes on Christ, we pray for Holy Spirit produced reverence. Holy Spirit produced longing, hope, anticipation, and love. We have already sung this morning that we love you and that we will ever love you. What lofty words. We recognize the mixed condition in our own hearts and our easy tendencies to be distracted. Oh God, we aspire to those words and one day they will be very true. We will love you with an unflinching, unassailable love, forever secured in glory. And for now, we fight the fight of faith. And that we ask that you would use your word in our hearts by your spirit to accomplish your purposes. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn in your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 5, and we will pick up where we left off last week, looking at the scroll from the throne. You may have heard the phrase doom scrolling. You may be a regular doom scroller. Apparently, doom scrolling is opening up social media or a news feed and scrolling through doom, <laughs> bad news, uh, the, the next insights into everything that's wrong with the world. I think I could have a temptation to doom scroll endlessly. I think there is a remedy if you're given to doom scrolling through the headlines, social media updates, etc. I would suggest scrolling through the book of Revelation as a regular diet for good health, for sanity. What we find here in the book of Revelation being opened in chapter 6, being handed to the Lord Jesus Christ here in the throne room in chapter 5, is God's scroll of doom. It is that scroll of destiny. It is the scroll of the unfolding judgments of heaven against the earth dwellers in their rebellion against God. And we asked the question last week from Ecclesiastes 7, who can straighten what God has bent? Remember that the world that we live in is bent by God, that it is, it is cursed by him. From childbirth to manual labor, every aspect of our under the sun existence is affected by the curse of God on rebellious humanity. Things don't work the way they should. Rust eats metal. Bodies fall apart and decay. Natural disasters inflict us. We all, of course, face death. God said to Adam that he would indeed eat instead of dying immediately after sinning against God in the garden, but that he would eke bread out the ground by the sweat of his face. Life's going to be hard. Maybe you go to work during the week and you think, my job is cursed. You're right, biblically, it is cursed. Genesis 3 and Ecclesiastes 7. And the next job you get after this one will be cursed as well, and the next after that, and the next after that. The illusion of greener grass somewhere around the corner to escape the curse is not of this era. It will not happen until the Lord himself comes and reverses the curse and sets all things right. That is what we look forward to. So when Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 7, who can straighten what God has bent? It may be intended as a rhetorical question there, but there is a biblical answer. The Lord Jesus Christ will straighten what God has bent. He will undo 
the curse. The answer to that question is here in the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation. The singular answer to all the world's problems. The one who will set the world straight. The one who will right all wrongs. Let's read again the first five verses of Revelation chapter 5. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. We remember that the fundamental problem of our world, found in chapter 4, verse 11, the recognition that the Lord alone is worthy to receive glory and honor and power because he created everything. But man in his rebellion against God has worshipped and served the created thing rather than the creator who is forever praised. They have not honored God as he is due, but we have run in our rebellion against him. God will fix all of this. We we are looking here in Revelation chapter 5 at the solution to the world's problem. All of the world's problems. And this comes in the opening scene here in Revelation 5. We're looking at five parts of this opening scene. And the first is that doomsday scroll, verse 1. In the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a book or a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed up with the seven seals. God God is on his throne, surrounded by the four living beings and the 24 elders on thrones. They all worship But that worship in heaven is not yet reflected on earth. And so God has a scroll. What is this seven-sealed scroll? This is, in part, the answer to the world's problems. It probably reflects a, a Roman will or a testament, a legal document that only the authorized recipient could open. It's reminiscent of Ezekiel's scroll of lamentations, mourning, and woe. It probably has a hint of Jeremiah's sealed land contract in Jeremiah 32, which leads many interpreters to see this scroll as the title deed to all of creation. Only Jesus is the rightful owner of the earth. But the contents of this scroll are not to be read. They are to be executed. This is a scroll of destiny, a scroll of doom, and a scroll of salvation. Its contents are the successive prophetic events that detail God's judgment against the earth, his redemptive plan for the earth, and how the rightful king will come and take possession. That led to the angel's question in verse 2. The strong angel with a booming voice queries, who is worthy to open the book? The answer is in heaven's silence, verse 3. No one said a word. No one was able. No one was able to open the book or to look into it. No one was qualified to advance God's judgment, God's redemptive program for the cosmos. No one was worthy to judge the rebels and evict the usurpers. No one was worthy to bring down the arrogant and lift up the humble, to right all wrongs, to straighten what was crooked to reverse the curse and bring God's peace. No one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth is authorized, powerful, or qualified to bring heaven down. And so everything stops in verse 3 and waits for someone. This leads us to the fourth part of this opening scene, and we see here in verse 4 the prophet's grief. This is where we'll pick up this morning Look at verse 4. Then I was weeping greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. John here in verse 4 gives background to what's coming in verse 5. John is weeping. The translation in, in our English Bibles probably should not be he began to weep. 
but rather he was in a continual state of weeping much. John found himself in a state of grief. This, on John's part, is an unrestrained emotional burst. It marks an intense longing. This is the same word for weeping that is used of Jesus in Luke 19, 41. There in that scene, it's, it's amazing, Jesus wept as he approached the city of Jerusalem. He was moved to grief over the lack of faith, the lack of repentance of the people who should have been looking for Messiah's arrival. Jesus comes over the hill, sees the city of Jerusalem, and weeps. The same word for weeping that is used of Peter in Luke twenty two sixty two. That is the scene where Peter had denied that he even knew Christ, and he emphasized that denial with curses, and then a rooster crowed. And Jesus was in eyesight of Peter and turned and looked right at him. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Are there tears in heaven? This is the only recorded instance of tears in heaven. The the non-glorified prophet, he's not yet a permanent resident at this point. The rest of heaven remains silent. John, the apostle, the prophet, the seer, who has been transported across time and across space into this throne room scene in the future, seems to be alone in his sorrow. He has been invited into this future scene when the rightful king is about to reclaim the earth. And yet it seems for some moments that there's no one qualified to advance God's redemptive plan. And so John was weeping. If the final kingdom does not arrive, mankind will be left to its own devices. The universe will remain bent under the curse. And the world will continue to suffer under the murderous aims of the God of this world. For as long as God's kingdom arrival is postponed, humanity will go on building its towers of Babel, run its races of futility, and abide in darkness and slavery to sin. And if no one is found worthy to open the book and to break its seals, there will be no vindication of the saints. Those who have believed God's word on the earth and and have clung to God's word by faith and have been proclaimers of God's word even at the cost of their own lives, they would not be vindicated. There would be no vindication of the truth, only the perpetuation of lies. There would be no judgment of the world for its sins, no end to the corruption of vice and villainy. There would be no restoration of the earth. The world would keep on spinning in rebellion under the curse, a domain of darkness. And there would be no vindication of God This breaks the heart of that fisherman from Galilee. The disciple, John, turned apostle and then turned prophet. John was going about his daily business one day when the maker of the universe interrupted his blue-collar worksite and called him to follow. Do you remember Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. So John the disciple followed Jesus of Nazareth for three years. He caught glimpses of kingdom come. He saw the hungry fed, physically and spiritually. He witnessed the lame walking, the deaf hearing, and the blind seeing. John saw demons flee. He saw the dead raised again to life, all at the hand of the son of Joseph and Mary. It was, this, it was as if everywhere this man went, the light of heaven pierced the darkness of the sin-blackened world, and a shaft of heavenly hope spotlighted his path. Where he walked, the curse on creation reversed its course. What he touched became unbent. When he spoke, the light of truth broke through the darkness of deceit. Captives were freed, sinners forgiven, good news was proclaimed. Was it possible that those glimpses of the kingdom that John had seen might not culminate in a universal reality? Would human history go on and on in its woeful state? Now, I don't believe that John thought that the future was in doubt, but he was clearly in this scene experiencing the grief of its delay. 
maybe even in his grief, imagining what it would be like if no one could be found to open the scroll. And I think we can appreciate the prophet's angst here in this scene. You who love God, who take God at his word by faith, does it not burden your soul to see the world refuse him, reject him, malign him? Aren't you weary of knowing the truth, yet watch the world bury the truth, suppress the truth, lie against the truth, even proclaim with audacious bravado, there is no truth? Aren't you weary of a sea of humanity stealing oxygen, traipsing across God's green earth, occupying his moments, employing his opportunities, squandering his gifts, wasting his resources? Does it not break your heart that all things intended by God to bring him glory and to provide for human happiness are here twisted and perverted, turned by sin into shriveled shadows of the things they were supposed to be? Does it not bother you to hear, God, to hear people use God's name with no reference to him as worthy of worship? even to drop his name as a curse word, or perhaps even worse, to use his name as just filler so that the name of God means nothing on the lips of his creatures. Does not your soul ache? I fear at times we get too used to it all, too accustomed to the norms of this world that we forget that We are pilgrims in a foreign land. We are citizens of a heavenly city. We belong to an otherworldly place. We are gods. We belong to him. But we live in this world. The better glimpses of glory we get, the more our hearts should ache over the state of this world and the delay of its being made right. That is the apostle's angst here. He has already heard from the lips of Jesus that the coming judgment of God is necessary. Jesus said to him, I will show you what must soon take place. The opening of the scroll of doom, the the scroll of universal restoration must commence. The opening of this scroll will mean the execution of God's plan of judgment and God's plan of redemption. John weeps because none in heaven, on earth, or under the earth is found worthy to bring about what must take place. That leads us to the fifth part of this opening scene. Here in verse 5, it is the final answer. One of the elders said to me, John reports, one of the permanent residents of heaven has the answer. While no one has stepped forward, volunteered to open the scroll, it it seems that all of heaven is ready with the answer. One of the elders surrounding the throne speaks up and, and he commands John, and notice what he says to John, stop weeping. Stop weeping. This is an interesting command. I, I don't think John's grief was misplaced, although at one level it's inappropriate somewhat like the the weeping in Luke 7. In Luke 7, uh, verse 13, Jesus gives a similar command. He says, do not weep. And he said this to a widow who had lost her son. Her son had died. And with her son's death, probably her closest means of provision along with the obvious heartbreak of a mother's loss. Verse 13 of Luke 7 says, When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her, and he said to her, Do not weep. The prohibition against crying here was not harsh, it was compassionate. And he came up and he touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped the onlookers. In Luke 8.52, you have a similar scene. 
In Luke 8, 52, Jesus said, stop weeping. And here Jesus raised Jairus' daughter. In such a situation with the Lord of the universe about to reverse the curse, the tears are unbecoming because of what Jesus is about to do. To reverse the course of what we have come to feel as natural events, to undo death. And the elder says, stop weeping, behold. Look, check this out. And the elder turns John's gaze to Christ. Turns all of our eyes to Jesus. Focuses our attention on the one in whom is wrapped up all of God's purposes. Look at this one, the elder says. For God's purposes shall not fail. His promises will not fall. And notice what he says. The lion that is from the tribe of Judah. The lion is that majestic, ferocious, terrifying beast. The king of the animals on the earth. If you've been to the zoo in Chicago and heard the lion's roar, that's a zoo where you can get terrifyingly close to very large, scary animals. This picture of a lion evokes royalty, power, authority. But the reference here is to Genesis chapter 49, and I would turn your attention there. A promise was made long ago Concerning one who would come forth, a man who would be born, a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of Isaac, a descendant of Jacob, a descendant of Judah. Listen to this promise in Genesis 49, 8 through 10. Judah, your brothers shall praise you your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. For the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples." And that phrase in verse 10, until Shiloh comes, can be translated, until he comes to whom it belongs. And here in this promise, it's the promise of rulership and the imagery of a lion. What is promised for us in Revelation chapter 5 is that very one, the fulfillment of the Genesis 49 promise through the tribe of Judah, that the lion of the tribe of Judah will come. He will be king he will be the answer to the world's problems. And notice the elder goes on with another Old Testament image, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the root of David. And this comes from Isaiah chapter 11. I want you to turn there as well. Notice verse 1. Isaiah 11.1. 1. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Jesse is David's father. This is the house of David. And a branch from its roots will bear fruit. And look down at verse 10. Then in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. Here in Isaiah 11, 1 and 10, we have a messianic promise, a promise about the, the role and the personhood of Messiah. He is called the root and the shoot of David. This is an interesting imagery. If you back up to Isaiah chapter 10, 
you have this interchange between God and Sennacherib, the ruler of Assyria, the ruler of the Assyrian armies, who came out against Israel, came out against Judah, came out against Jerusalem. Notice verse 12. It will be when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the pomp of his haughtiness, for he has said, verse 13, by the power of my hand and my wisdom I did this, and his coming against Jerusalem, while at the hand of a sovereign God, was sinful on its own part. That's why God addresses him in verse 15. Is the ax to boast itself over the one who chops with it? Is the saw to exalt itself over the one who wields it? That would be like a club wielding those who lift it, or like a rod lifting him who is not wood. There, God chose to use the nation of Assyria to judge the nation of Israel when Israel was in rebellion against God. And Assyria could easily have said, Israel's evil, God's using me to judge Israel, so I must be okay. But Assyria was not okay. Assyria itself was a rebellious nation that God was using as an implement of judgment against Israel. And so when God was done using Assyria as an implement of judgment against Israel, God would also punish Assyria. And look at the imagery of this. Down at verse 32. Today he will halt at Nob. He shakes his fist at the mountain of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Nob is a little village on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And while the Assyrian army had surrounded Jerusalem and conquered all of the Israeli cities leading up to the capital city, God stopped the Assyrian army a stone's throw away with a great slaughter so that Sennacherib turns tail. Verse 33, Behold, the Lord, Yahweh of armies, lops off the boughs with a terrible crash. Those also who are tall in stature will be cut down. Those who are lofty will be abased. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with an iron ax, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. So the mighty one is God, and Assyria, and the mighty Assyrian empire, which was the world power at the time, is gonna be lopped off like forests in Lebanon by people chopping down trees, left at the stump. If you can imagine a world superpower at the height of its glory, at the height of its power, on the verge of crushing all of its enemies, all of a sudden, by God's power, by nothing that could be seen on earth, being decimated and turned away, and a mighty forest left as stumps. God has the power to overrule all kingdoms and to accomplish his purposes. And the imagery in verse 10 of a lopped off forest with just stumps where the mighty forest of Lebanon had been. The very next verse describes, then a shoot will spring from the root of Jesse. It's an interesting contrast because at this point Israel was nothing. And after the Assyrian captivity of the northern tribes and the Babylonian captivity of the southern tribes, Israel was completely in exile and nobody is on the throne of David. The land is completely overrun by pagan empires and would subsist under the times of Gentiles down to our very day. And yet this promise, you look at a wasteland, God just turned Lebanon to a wasteland. God just decimated the mighty world army, world power army of Assyria in a snap. And if you think he can't keep his promises to Israel, no, no matter how bad the scene looks, look to this promise. This promise of a, a shoot, a branch from the roots of Jesse is God's promise that he will keep his promises. It's a shoot where no one expected one. The idea of a root here is not the, the root from which David came, but the family lineage of David to which the promises were made about a coming king whose end will never, or whose uh, rule will never end. He will come from this family that seems like it's completely lopped off. I had a Chinese elm in my front yard it provided shade to my house, and we lost it in a windstorm. 
whole thing came crashing down, snapped off at ground level. I like Chinese elms. I missed that tree. I had another tree in my front yard with a bunch of thorns. When the windstorm took that one down, I pulled it up by the root ball, you know, attached a chain to the root ball and the other end of the, to the suburban out in the street and yanked and pulled and finally got the root ball out of there. This Chinese elm, I, I didn't want to pull it up by the roots. I wanted to see what would happen. And within a year, a shoot came up out of the root structure. And now there's an 18-foot Chinese elm in the front yard. That is the scene here. That's the picture. A, a shoot, unexpected. When all you see was a lopped-off trunk. This is the way this Isaiah 11 text is used throughout the New Testament to describe Christ. A shoot, a a new branch from the line of David. And I want you to see in Jeremiah 33, the future of this righteous branch. What will he do? Jeremiah 33, 14. Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Notice all tribes together. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And this is the name by which she will be called. Yahweh is our righteousness. For thus says Yahweh, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. This has not yet happened. And it is true that Jesus of Nazareth, born of the household of David, came to the earth. But he has not yet executed justice and righteousness across the earth. Judah and Jerusalem have not been saved to dwell in safety. And they are not yet called the Lord is our righteousness. These are outstanding promises from God. And it may appear yet that Israel is a dead stump with no spiritual life. And this sprout where none expected will rule. When the Davidic line looked like a goner, when Israel looks like a goner, by the way, this is why the genealogies in the New Testament are so important, that Jesus of Nazareth was the son of David, could trace his lineage all the way back to David's family so that he could qualify as the Lion of Judah and the Rood of David. Both of these were messianic designations. Revelation 5 is the only place in your Bible where these two concepts, the Lion of Judah and the Root of David, are linked together. Although it is interesting in intertestamental literature, the kind of uh, literature that was found at Qumran, out in the desert, they had a messianic expectation and they put the ideas of Son of Man, Son of God, Root of David, Lion of Judah, all together into an expectation of what Messiah would do when he comes. And what's interesting, in Messiah's first coming, he didn't execute justice across the earth. He didn't reign as the Davidic king yet. He came for another purpose the first time. But all of this promise, the root of David and the lion of the tribe of Judah, culminates God's plans and purposes in Messiah. All the way back to Genesis chapter 3. You remember the promise that God made to the snake who deceived the woman. God said to the snake, to the serpent of old, the woman will bear seed that will crush your head. In Genesis 12, this promise was narrowed to the seed that would come through Abraham that would then be a blessing to all the nations. In Genesis 49, we saw this seed promise would come through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, and through the tribe of Judah. And to such a one would belong the royalty, the rule, In 2 Samuel 7, this gets narrowed through David and and the kingdom that comes from that one would be without end. In Psalm 2, we discover that this one is the Son of God who would be installed on Mount Zion with all the nations as his inheritance. 
the earth as his possession. He would rule the kings of the earth. He would receive homage from them. And he would bless all those who take refuge in him. And we see this in Psalm 110 where this messianic figure, the the hinge point of all of these promises would be the Lord, Adonai. At Yahweh's right hand, he would rule over his enemies. He would be a priest and a king and he would judge the nations. And in Daniel 7, we discovered that this one would also be called the Son of Man. And he would be given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that all the peoples, all the nations, all the languages would serve him. His dominion would be an everlasting dominion which would not pass away and his kingdom would be one which could not be destroyed. This is why the angel said to Mary in Luke chapter 1 at Jesus' birth, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And all these promises terminate in Christ. And notice what the elder says in verse 5 of Revelation 5. Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, bringing all of these promises together, he has overcome so as to open the book in its seven seals. In other words, on the lips of this elder, what qualifies this one to open the book to break its seals, to usher in God's judgments against the earth, to bring heaven down, was his overcoming. His overcoming. And notice how this is said. He has overcome. This scene predates the overthrow of Satan, the destruction of Antichrist and the false prophet. The overcoming here is is not the final victory that will come at Revelation 19 at the descent of Christ to the earth. The overcoming referred to here is the overcoming that has already taken place. This will become more clear in verse 6 we'll look at next week. But here the overcoming that is described is clearly the overcoming of Jesus' cross work. That which he did at his first coming. Romans 8.3 describes Jesus' overcoming as a, a victory over sin. In Hebrews 2 The author there tells us that Jesus had victory over death for himself and for all those who would believe. Colossians 2, Paul tells us that Jesus' victory at the cross was a victory over the enemies in the spiritual realms. And then in 1 John 5, all those who are joined to Christ by faith also are said to be overcomers. Victors, 1 John 5, 5. What is overcoming? It is the victory that comes for all those who have faith in Jesus. And so believers likewise overcome sin and death and enemies in the spiritual realms and even the world. Jesus' overcoming work qualifies him, verse 5, to open the book and its seven seals. The Lion of Judah's overcoming work at the cross qualifies him to open the scroll, to break the seals, to execute God's judgment against the nations, and to bring in the kingdom that will dislodge all other kingdoms. And think about it. Jesus did the hard thing first. Turn over to Romans chapter 8. In Romans 8.31, God makes this amazing statement to us finite creatures clinging by faith to Jesus. What shall we say to these things? God being for us, who against us? Rhetorical question. Nobody can be against those who are in Christ. Why? Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? What is God saying there? 
He did the hard thing first. If God did the hard thing of not sparing his son, if Jesus did the hard thing, as as Matt taught us this morning during our communion meditation, Jesus did not call down legions of angels to defend himself. He suffered in the garden of Gethsemane. He, He stood accused wrongly before a kangaroo court and was murdered by his creatures. Jesus did the hard thing first. And if he was not spared, if God did not spare his son, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? The sovereign of the universe, omnipotent, all-powerful, the one in whose presence no one could stand and oppose, gives his children all things. The cross work was the hard work. For Jesus, taking back the universe, piece of cake. It's easy. Resting back the world from its usurpers and its rebels is easy work for Christ. And listen, this is a spoiler alert. Revelation chapter 19 is coming. In fact, in Revelation 19 verse 11, you, you can peek ahead if you want. We'll get there in a couple years. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, on his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows but himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Look down at verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. Look at verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him. Think of that. All the world's armies and technologies and leaders assembled against one And notice what happens. The beast was seized. And with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped the image. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. What happens in this final battle? Beast false prophet, and then the one behind them, Satan, the god of this world, the great dragon, the serpent of old, incarcerated. It's easy for Jesus to conquer the world. It's easy for him to come back and to dislodge the usurpers and to judge the nations. It was hard for him to go to the cross. He's done the hard thing already. This is why the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 110, says this, He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Drinking from the brook with his head lifted is a way for the psalm writer to say that the victory came easy. The outcome is sure. This warrior king will have an easy day of defeating all of his enemies in one sweep. No one will withstand his approach. The corpses of his enemies will come feast for the birds of the air, and the arch enemies will be picked up and thrown away. Jesus has the right, the authority, the power, and the purpose to do all of these things. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is the rightful heir to the Davidic throne. He is son of God and son of man. He is king of all kings. He is the creator and sustainer of all. And he is judge of all the earth. Consider the petty tyrants of human history, the usurpers. Remember Lamech in Genesis 4? Under Lamech, you had the proliferation of technology but you also had the redefinition of marriage, the proliferation of murder and vengeance on the earth. Then you have those builders of Babel on the plain of Shinar. 
And you just walk through the whole host of, of those leaders and those rulers who tried to sort of own the world in an anti-Christ sort of way. Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians. You think of the pride of Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Caesars of Rome. In more recent history, Attila the Hun and the Hitlers and Stalins and Pol Pots, Idi Amin, and a whole host of lesser known tyrants and despots who in their puny ways sought to rule, put others under the thumb, exercise tyranny. Human history has been led and dominated by a train of godless usurpers who have all sought to rule the earth. None could stand before the lion of the tribe of Judah. And of course, behind them all is Satan, the god of this world. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, our attention is drawn to Christ. All eyes on him. See the lion awake. The true David, the son of God and son of man. I referenced Luke 19 a few moments ago. Turn back there as we close this morning. This is the scene of Jesus weeping as he approaches Jerusalem. And I'll summarize Luke 19 for you. In the first scene, you have the tax collector, Zacchaeus, welcomed into God's family. The tax collector was the most despised Israelite in Israel. Lowest on the totem pole of respect. Certainly a sinner. And Jesus welcomed him into God's family, forgiving his sin. And then you have a parable about the failed stewards, failed stewardship. Uh, my Bible labels this a parable about money usage. It, it really is about Israel's failed stewardship of the oracles of God and access to God. And then a warning to the disciples about ongoing stewardship, what, what they should be doing with God's resources before he returns to set up his kingdom. The king's going away, but the king's coming back, and you better do right by his stuff. All of this culminates in verse 27. Jesus ends that parable with this statement, these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. That's more than parabolic. All of a sudden, this is an axiomatic statement at the end of the parable describing what will happen at the end of this age. The king will return, and those who did not want him to reign over them at the heart level will face eternal accountability. And then in the next verse, you have the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. After he said these things, Luke reports, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. In verse 38, the crowd had gathered and they said, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The Pharisees said to the disciples, uh, said to Jesus, Rebuke the crowd. Rebuke these guys following you. And Jesus' response, If I, or if they are silent, the stones will cry out. Do you understand there is something right about Jesus reigning on the earth that all creation knows? And when he approached Jerusalem, verse 41, he saw the city and wept over it. Why did Jesus weep? Verse 42, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which would have made for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. This was precisely 483 years after Nehemiah 2 in keeping with Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, that this would happen at this moment that the king would enter Jerusalem. But then he would be rejected. Israel would fall. In the next paragraph, Jesus describes the judgment that is coming on Jerusalem. And then the response, the response of the authorities they rejected him and murdered him. 
Why did Israel reject its king at his first coming? Why does the world now reject its maker? Why do sinners reject the only one who can forgive? Why do those who are desperately sick refuse help? Think about your own life this morning. You know from God's word that the king is coming back. He's coming back to save those who are his, to rescue them from the corruption in the world. He's coming back to vindicate his own name. He's coming back to judge those who reject him. Are you rejecting Christ in your own heart? Are you refusing forgiveness from the only one who offers it? Are you rejecting treatment for the mortal disease that you carry? Why do we do this? Because our sickness is that deep. Part of the disease of sin is the deception that tells you you're okay with it. And friend, you're not. If you're here this morning and if you, you have not yet surrendered to King Jesus, maybe you think he was a good teacher. Maybe you think he was a historical figure. Maybe you think he never existed at all. He's coming back. Will you surrender to him? Today, even today, could be a day of salvation for you, of new life, of rescue from slavery to sin, from the futility of life lived in rebellion to your maker. Come to him, and you will find love, forgiveness, peace with God, life transformation. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we do just beg this morning that all those who hear your words would turn to you in faith. That those who do not yet know you would find in you a gentle Savior before they find one day a King who will judge for sin. You are all of these things. And you have been patient, patient to allow people to hear your gospel and to turn to you in faith. Lord Jesus, would you arrest all of our hearts that we would resonate with the prayer that you gave to your disciples. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord Jesus, to you be all glory. Amen.